Hello, I'm Susan King, and I'm the Dean of the School of Journalism and Mass Communication, and I have with me a wonderful executive in the advertising world. I'm going to read it exactly. BBDO, Worldwide President and CEO, Andrew okay. Robertson. That's me. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. It's nice to be here. And as everyone will know, just by looking at the stripes and your accent, you are born and bred somewhere else, but you're a total American. <laughs> yeah, I'm a total American. Citizen for eight years, yeah. Well, Lived welcome. here for 14. Um, you're in every make. I want to talk to you about the advertising business. You've seen it change over the last couple of years. And I want to pursue it. But I want you to identify with our students who are watching this, who are, you know, 20, 21 years old and thinking they want to be you. How did you start? You were a, a major in economics in London. You want the, you want uh, the truth. Of course. Uh, well, when I was a student, I was uh, I was doing economics, but as little of it as possible. <laughs> and um, I used to I used to commute in from I was at university in London, and I would commute in from um, out of town where my parents were living. Uh, and every Monday evening, I used to make a hundred cold calls. Uh, I was selling. I used to sell life insurance as a student. So I would on Monday night I would make a hundred calls, and then I would have appointments on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday sometimes. And then I would go and do my appointments. And if I did, made a hundred calls, I got ten appointments. If I got ten appointments, I made three sales. And out of those three sales, I earned enough money to live extremely, extremely well. And um, I, so every night after I finished those appointments, I used to go to a nightclub called the Valbon on the river and Maidenhead and hang out there till half past two in the morning, and then maybe go and play backgammon until five or six in the morning and then go and sleep till 11 and go to college, repeat for two years. And as I got into my final semester, my father said to me, you know, this, this can't go on. And um, we're happy while you're still studying uh, for you to drive your mother's car and for you to live at home. But the day you graduate, you start paying rent or find your own place to live and you get your own car. Um, and I had this sudden crisis because I thought everything's falling apart. This is, my life isn't going to be the way it is. And that night I was standing at the, uh, at the bar of the Valbon nightclub, very, very morose, uh, wondering what was going to happen. And there was a guy standing next to me who I only knew, I'd only, I only knew him from that location, but he seemed to be there as often as I was. And he had an Alfa Romeo. And I said to him, um, what do you do for a living? And he said, I'm, I work for an advertising agency. And I thought, I'm, I'm going to do that. <laughs> it was as superficial and shallow as that. But you were already an entrepreneur of sorts if you were sort of having your own business. I mean, you were motivated. I, I, I mean, actually, it was one of the most useful things I ever did in my life. Um, and, and I got that job. I, I was a barman in, a, in the Maidenhead Conservative Club. And one, of my, and one of the customers said, you can come and sell insurance for me. Um, I won't pay you. I, I wasn't paid a salary at all. It was 100% commission. Uh, but he said, you can, I'll give you two days of training and you can uh, use the phone, which doesn't seem like a big deal, but in those days, in those days you paid by the call, so it was quite a big deal. Um, and uh, yeah, I learned a lot. I learned a lot about how to sell things. Well, some people think of advertising as really all about creating the dreams, creating the magic that gets people motivated to do something they didn't know they were motivated to do. Same as insurance. <laughs> Same as insurance. But that's also sort of what you had at that time. But, uh, and I think the lesson is all parents better tell their kids, you're on your own the day after graduation. That's, a, that's our lesson. Good motivator. Yeah. But you, did you know that you were a weaver of dreams and that's what advertising could be? I didn't really know. And, and um, I, I do think I was kind of lucky that it, that it worked out because I could have been standing next to somebody who was doing something I might never have enjoyed. Um, uh, but the more I got into it, the more I, the, the more I learned, the more I loved. But all your career has been both the creative side and the business side. You've always, you've always melded the two. Uh, I n I've never, they, they, they don't let me write ads. So I've, I've never, I've, well, I've had a couple slide through, but, uh, but generally I don't get to do that. I started as a media planner and I, I spent the first few years of my career in media planning and then moved into running clients and then uh, agency management. 
But the, I guess I meant by the creative side, you really were there thinking about what it was that you were selling, which yeah. was more creative than it was just, here's the analytics. Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. the success of the company seems to be having built those two. I mean, that those are equally important, um, the metrics and, and such. And that's kind of a new turn in advertising, don't you think? Um, well, it's something we welcome, uh, you know, having, having better data and better analytics helps inform um, the strategies and the thinking that we do before we create the work. Um, and as importantly, it helps us optimize and, and really measure the efficacy of the work as and after it runs. And if you believe, which was a kind of conviction on our part, that um, um, the best work works best, uh, to be able to prove it, not just mm -hmm. every couple of years in, you know, advertising effectiveness competitions, but literally campaign by campaign, day by day, increasingly hour by hour and minute by minute, uh, that's a very good thing. So it, we, we really embrace everything that, um, that data and uh, analytics can bring to the business because it's, it's good for business. Right, it makes them come back. Yeah. Um, Tell me a little bit about this idea of the global company, because in the old days, too, there might have been a company in New York and there was a company in London, and now they're owned by just a few, so that mm. they're huge companies. H how does that work, that they understand and, um, first the customer or the client, and, and how do they work effectively and not become bureaucracies? Well, you have to, um, you know, uh, if, you, if you're smart about it, being big and be global can give you a real competitive advantage for, for two reasons. One is uh, you have more legs to put on the court. And, and one of the things that happens in our business is, you know, people, people get blocks. You know, that's like writers, they have a writer's block. And what you need to be able to do at that moment is take them off the court and put, put some fresh legs on. And, and if you have scale, you have the advantage of having the legs. Um, but the second thing which is, which is more important is uh, you can really uh, leverage the knowledge, the experience, the ideas, the mistakes, the contacts of everyone in the network to build the business anywhere in the network. So part of the value is winning, managing, developing and growing our multinational and global clients. But the other part is leveraging the knowledge and experience of a network to make each of us better, faster. Um, so if you're smart, it's a, it's a positive, not a negative. You do have to guard against um, bureaucracy and becoming big and bloated. You have to, you have to really work consciously against it. Uh, but if you do, it, it, you, can, you can have a real competitive advantage. In the old days, they didn't use the word network so much. They probably just said the company or something. Mm. For our young folks, what's that mean to be part of this network? How do they get to be individual and not caught up in something that smothers them? Uh, well, they're not going to succeed if they allow themselves to be smothered. Mm. Um, the, the, the network only works because of the diversity of talent that exists within it. Um, we have a very singular purpose. We're all about the work, the work, the work, uh, creating and delivering the world's most compelling commercial content. That's what we're here to do. Um, we have three simple operating principles, uh, secure an unfair share of the limited pool of exceptional talent. Um, we can never have as much as we want, but we want more than our fair share. Uh, leverage that as widely as you can across, uh, across brands, communications forms and countries. And then use the network, as I was just talking about, use the experience and knowledge and contacts of the network to, to grow the business locally as well as across the network. Um, and the, you know the talent that we are looking for uh, has to has to help build the culture that is part of what helps us deliver what we say we're going to deliver, but also what differentiates us from our competitors and makes us work as a network. And we and we've got a set of characteristics that we use to to kind of define what those people look and behave like, mm. um, but, but one of them is not that they're all the same as each other. Mm. So you're a talent developer, really, is one of the major? It's the most, the most important thing we do. So tell that 21-year-old who's trying to figure out how they're going to pay their bills right after graduation, what, is the, what are you looking for? How do you define talent? What should they be really 
Well, we, uh, the, the, the 10 characteristics that we look for are uh, people who make the work better. They help make the work better. And this is, these are things that should apply to everybody from, from me to the receptionist. They help make the work better. Their clients love them, not just like or respect. Love them. Clients love them. So they have to be good at relationships. Really good at it. They've got to want to do that. Um, they should present well. They should be closers, not just get through meetings. Uh, business is full of people who can get through meetings. We Sign on the dotted line. Yes or no. A, a no is good. Mm -hmm. It's better than maybes. Okay. Uh, they need to be radiators, not drains. Um, mm. we, we like people to bring energy to the room rather than suck it out of it. Mm -hmm. uh, hand raisers, not finger pointers. Um, we, not me. They need to be able to pick themselves up fast because you do take some bumps. Um, and avoiding them isn't an option, but picking yourself up fast. So will, resilient. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, they need to uh, have what we call um, a healthy paranoia. And in a business where you, where you sell things for a living, there's a lot of people running around saying how fantastic everything is. You need people who are saying, yes, things are good, but what could happen? Okay. What, what, what could happen? Uh, and then people who do the right thing because you, you, you make thousands of decisions a day where you, you could go left or right. And you, you need people who are going to consciously pick the right one. Um, uh, and those are the, you know, those are the things that we look for mm -hmm. in the people we hire because those are the things that we observe uh, in the people who do best in the company and do best for the company. And what I like about that is none of those are those little old-fashioned skilled things we talk about. Good writer, you know, this is all about who you are and what you bring to the Yeah, because that's yeah. how you shape a culture. Yeah. That's how you shape a culture. And, uh, you know, we have a, 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 one of the best... Uh, lessons of, uh, of Omnicom University is uh, um, in the war between strategy and culture, culture eats strategy for breakfast. So, so having, having a, a really well-defined culture that you develop is, in our view, a prerequisite for being able to execute any kind of strategy. So I want to ask you about one of the things that intrigued me when I was reading about you, and that was that this great, the, the role of failure is, is the headline. And as you say, you have to pick yourself up is one of the strategies for the, one of those 10 necessary pieces. You had, as a business, Gillette for 80 years or something, lost them in 2013, a huge blow to the company, and yet you came back the next year bigger and better and winning more awards, mm. you know, the agency of the globe. Mm. What did that failure mean for you and to the company, and how did you use it in the culture? Well, you have to, I mean, <laughs> I, I, I'd rather not have it, but it <laughs> happens. It happens. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, in this business, I guess, ultimately, you will lose every client eventually. Sometimes it may take 100 years, but you will lose every client eventually. So the issue is not, I mean, it's not, you don't want to lose them, but, but when you do it, you have to pick yourself up and go out and replace it. And you're not always gonna be able to replace like with like. Sometimes you're gonna lose a, a, a big client and then you're gonna to have to replace it with 30 smaller clients. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, uh, the first thing is you try not to lose them. When you do lose them, you have to learn the lessons that Come you on. didn't know about why you lost them mm -hmm. and what you could have done differently to avoid losing them. And then, having done that, you've got to just pick, up, pick yourself up and get out there and shake the trees and, and, uh, and replace them. And um, so it, 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 spending any time kind of in a pity party talking about how rotten it was isn't, isn't going to help. You, you, you just got to get back on the horse. So as a leader, do you become a cheerleader? Well, I think um, I, I, somebody I once worked with had a wonderful line on this. He said, the only, the only acceptable demeanor is plausible optimism. Um, implausible optimism is bad. Right. So, Rosy scenario. Yeah, yeah. the blind Silly. optimist, nobody mm. believes. Mm. So, uh, but you, 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 have to, um, you have to give people somewhere to go and something to do. And, and um, so I do think optimism is an important, it's an important part of it. Otherwise, uh, it, yeah, your mood, mood is very infectious, good and bad. And I have seen that the best leaders, I mean, let's go to, you know, the, the Brits, you know, I mean, in the war, that sign victory, yeah. I mean, that was an optimist leading at a really it, dark time, right? It was in very, very dark times. That's, yeah. Which is not to say, again, that pretending that, there's, that everything is great doesn't work. You right. have to accept and acknowledge the things that are broken and that aren't working and, what, and that hurt. 
but then you have to say, and here's, and here's what we're going to do. Here's how we're going to move forward. This is what I'm going to do. This is what I need you to do. Um, then people can, people are remarkable, actually. So thinking back to that young man who was trying to figure out what he was going to do and heard advertising, it sounds like the movie I heard, Plastics in the Graduate or something. <laughs> right. um, has it been a better career than you expected, different career than you expected? I didn't really, I didn't really know what to expect, to be honest. So, um, and, and I've never had, you know, I've never had like a big plan for how it could or would evolve. Um, I've really only ever concentrated on the job I'm doing and the people I'm working with. But it, um, and that's kind of worked out. Um, but it's been, it is, it is a lot of fun. And one of, and, and one of the, you know, the, the three things I, I, I love about it, one is uh, I get to work with fantastic people, uh, really, you know, they're the people you'd want to spend your time hanging around with, which or I would. So that, that's a great thing because you're going to spend a lot of time with them. Um, every now and again you do a piece of work or somebody in your organization does a piece of work that, um, that everybody talks about and I, I enjoy that feeling. Um, uh, and the third thing is it's always changing. You know, it's, it is literally always changing. Uh, at, any, at any one point there's always something, something that is, uh, that is changing quite dramatically. So in a sense, you, you, you don't have one career, you have lots of careers, they just happen to be in the same business. Andrew Robertson, thank you for coming and doing the Reed Surratt Lecture. It's a real pleasure. And talking to our students and giving them perhaps that word in their ear um, <laughs> that will make a difference for them. Thank oh, you. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure. Thank you.